Welcome to the virtual worship service of Palm West Community Church in Sun City West, Arizona for August 2nd, 2020. Though we are not gathered physically, we are united in the singular purpose to honor God through Christ in song and prayer and instruction from his word. Also, this being the first Sunday of the month, Pastor Jim will lead us in a time of celebration of communion at the end of the service. So you might want to pause this video and gather bread and wine. In these days of uncertainty, when yes no longer means yes and no no longer means no, when promises are broken and misconduct is justified, when deceit is offered as righteousness, where can the devoted follower of Christ turn to find the genuine truth? Only in the truthful word of our trustworthy God do we have such a firm foundation. Let's sing together, How Firm a Foundation. Good morning, church, or afternoon, or evening, or whenever you might be watching this online worship service. This morning, as we come into our pastoral prayer, we remember the situations and the challenges that are before us as a church family. We remember those who are under hospice care, those who are homebound, and of course, the continuing health concerns of those who are connected to our church family. Also, as I've been trying to highlight over these last couple of weeks, we pray for those struggling with the COVID virus, those who are impacted financially, physically, those who have lost loved ones, and we pray for those who are engaged in the battle against this thing, those who are on the front lines, our, our essential workers, our doctors, our nurses, our researchers. And we also pray for unity and reconciliation and peace for our nation. As we think of our needs, I wanna to bring to you this morning these words from David coming out of Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? 
When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk to me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. For this morning's prayer, this is actually a written prayer that comes from the Northumbria community in the UK. Please pray with me. In the shadow of your wings, we will sing your praises, O Lord. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is our refuge, the refuge of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? In the shadow of your wings, we will sing your praises, O Lord. One thing we ask of the Lord, it's one thing we seek to dwell in the presence of our God, to gaze on your holy place. In the shadow of your wings, we will sing your praises, O Lord. We believe we shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. O wait for the Lord, have courage and wait. Wait for the Lord. In the shadow of your wings, we will sing your praises, O Lord. We ask all of this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, amen. Is your burden heavy as you bear it all alone? Does the road you travel harbor dangers yet unknown? Are you growing weary in the struggle of it all? Jesus When on his name you call, he is always there, hearing every prayer, faithful and true, walking by your side, in his love we hide, all the day through. Just remember what to do, reach out to Jesus, he's reaching out to you. Is the life you're living filled with sorrow and despair? Does the future press you? With its worries and its care Are you tired and friendless? Have you almost lost your way? Jesus will help you Just come to him today He is always there here Every prayer faithful and true, walking by your side in his love we hide all the day through. When you get discouraged, just remember what to do. Reach out to Jesus, he's reaching out to you. He is always there, hearing every prayer, faithful and true. Walking by our side, in his love we hide all the 
day through When you get discouraged Just remember what to do Reach out to Jesus Reach out to Jesus Yes, reach out to Jesus He's reaching out to Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Palm West Community Church. Thank you for joining us today, and it's uh, wonderful to be with you uh, after having two weeks of being self-quarantined, but uh, I'm feeling good. It's good to be back, and uh, also it's very good to see the numbers here in Arizona are actually trending in a much better, uh, much better way, and so as leaders, we'll be uh, anxious to be meeting in the next couple of weeks to be evaluating those to talk about our uh, options for reopening here at Palm West. Uh, Please know that we're going to continue to be prayerful and to do what we think is safe and best for our church family and um, and uh, but hopefully we'll uh, be able to have some decisions made in the next couple of weeks about what the future looks like here. Continue to take care of yourselves and uh, don't live in fear but also be wise and uh, we trust that God will continue to strengthen and guide us through this. Today we continue our sermon series on the book of Jeremiah entitled Exile and Hope. And we're talking about this book, this prophet, this incredible man that God used uh, to speak to the nation of Israel and specifically uh, Judah. Now, the last few weeks, we've looked at the life of the prophet himself, Jeremiah, and we've talked about Jeremiah and how God used him and the inner battles and challenges that he faced as a prophet. And today, we're going to begin to transition, and this week, we're going to be looking, and next week, at the subject of leadership. Today we're going to talk about good kings and bad kings, and we're going to look at the role that civil leadership played in the Israel nation, and Judah in particular, and how they responded to Jeremiah's message. And then next week we're going to look at the spiritual leaders and the role that they played in the nation of Israel. Now over the course of 40 years, Jeremiah worked with multiple different leaders, multiple kings. As a matter of fact, there were five specific kings that are mentioned in the book of Jeremiah that we'll talk about in just a moment. He also had two governors who were placed in charge after uh, Babylon had taken over. We also read about interactions with Necho, who was the leader of Egypt, and Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of Babylon. In other words, Nehemiah, I'm sorry, uh, Jeremiah, during his ministry, worked with multiple different kings, multiple different leaders on multiple different fronts. We see this in the beginning verses of Jeremiah, where in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 3, it says this, The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, through the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Joash, the son of uh, Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Joash, king of Judah, when the people of Israel went into exile. Now in these opening verses of Jeremiah, we read four different kings mentioned by name. Ammon had already died, but we read about Joash, we read about Jehoiakim, and we read about Zedekiah. But the reality was there were five different kings that spanned Jeremiah's ministry, five different kings that he had to interact with at different points in time. And some of these kings, one in particular, were good, and the rest of them were, quite frankly, not just bad, but a few of them were wretched and horrible kings. Now, I've got a little chart here that I want to put on the screen to look at. This is also available in our church email if you want to look at it more carefully that gives a little bit of a timeline of Jeremiah's ministry. He was called into ministry at 627, and this has sort of his call, and then Josiah's death, and then the Babylonian, first Babylonian invasion, the deportation of the first set of people, and then the Babylonian exile and the fall of Jerusalem in 586. Now, during this time, there were five different kings of Judah that Jeremiah worked with. The first was Josiah. Now, Josiah was a godly king. He was a godly man. He took over at eight years old. His grandfather Manasseh was perhaps the worst, most wretched, most ungodly king in the the history of Judah. His father, Ammon, only lived about two years before he was overthrown and murdered. And Josiah took over at eight years old. 
And at 16 years old, the Bible says that Josiah began to seek the Lord. And a few years after he began to seek the Lord, he commissioned the priest to clean the temple and to begin to renew and to restore the temple. And it was then that they found the book of the law, which had been lost for several years, the Deuteronomic code for the Israelite nation. And then Josiah pronounced these Uh, these reforms. He called the nation of Israel to celebrate the Passover, which had not been done for several decades. He tore down the high places. He eliminated the Asherah poles. He kicked out the temple prostitutes, the workers of magical arts. He took all these people, got them out of the temple, and brought about a great reform and a great renewal, which we'll talk about in a moment, to Israel. Now, he went into battle. The Egyptians were coming down, and a place called Megiddo, right? Some of us have maybe been to Megiddo. Megiddo, a place right outside of Jerusalem, Uh, There's a little town there in the valley of Megiddo. uh, Joash went out to fight the Egyptians and he lost his life. His son Joash took over, or uh, Joaz took over, but he only reigned for three months before he was taken uh, into captivity by the Egyptians. And then Jehoiakim took over and reigned for 11 years. Now Jehoiakim was not a very teachable person. He was very arrogant, uh, very anti, any kind of a message that uh, that Jeremiah would share. He reigned for 11 years before the Babylonians came in. The Babylonians conquered the Egyptians, and then they came and took over, and Jehoiakim was taken as a prisoner. Then his brother, Jehoiachin, took over for three months before he was uh, taken out of power. And then Nebuchadnezzar took Zedekiah and put Zedekiah in power here at about 597. So Zedekiah was put in position of power, and uh, I think it was 90, 97, yes, and uh, he was placed there by Nebuchadnezzar to be basically a vassal. Now, Zedekiah played both sides of the fence, though. While he served under Nebuchadnezzar, he was trying to make a treaty, and he was working with the Egyptians. He rebelled, and ultimately, it was Zedekiah's actions after 11 years that led to the downfall of Jerusalem when the city was leveled, completely burned down, and then he was taken into captivity after Nebuchadnezzar killed his son in front of him and then took his eyes. This were the kings that served under Jeremiah's ministry. And as I read about these kings and also read about them in the book of Chronicles and in Kings, you can read about them. And I've put together a little reading list that I've included in the email that the church sent out. You can read about these kings and learn more about them in detail as we read about them in other parts of the scriptures. But as I read about the kings who served under Jeremiah's leadership, there are three lessons I want to remind us of about civil leaders. First of all, the decisions of leaders have far-ranging and long-lasting consequences. You see, these leaders that, that were in place during Jeremiah's ministry, these people that, that, that God placed in leadership over the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem, they made decisions that were not just about the short term, but many of the decisions that they made, decisions to follow God or decisions to reject and to walk away from God, had far-ranging and long-lasting consequences every single one of them. Now you and I make decisions in our life. We've made decisions in our life. Some of us made decisions to go to school. Some of us dropped out of school. Some of us chose a career that we loved. Some of us chose a career that we hated. Some of us bought our home at the right time and the right location and some of us bought our home at the wrong time and the wrong location. Some of us invested our money wisely and some of us invested our money foolishly. Some of us have made these kinds of decisions good, bad, or indifferent. But many of our decisions have affected only us. Maybe they've reverberated down to our children or our grandchildren or our close friendships or our extended family. But most of the decisions that we make affect us. But when you have political leaders, civil leaders, kings, emperors, governors, presidents, these people make decisions that cascade down and they have a far-reaching effect upon people. It's not just about them. And those decisions they make have long-lasting effects to them. For an example, on May 28, 1930, President Andrew Jackson in the United States signed into law something called the Indian Removal Act. In my opinion, it was one of the most immoral, unconscionable, ungodly and unfair laws ever put in place by our government. It basically gave the American government the right to go in and to take land from the Native Americans 
And in some cases, if they were lucky, they would give them pennies on the dollar for their land. But they would forcibly remove them from their land and then they would transport them and they would trade and give them land that basically was worthless. And these Native Americans were no longer able to farm and to fish as they had done for hundreds and hundreds of years before. They were no longer able to be able to farm the way they had done because the land they were, they were given was basically impossible to farm and they weren't able to hunt. And so it basically not only removed all of their traditions, it caused them to start over again. And even on the situations where our government gave quality land, like the Lakota, which they gave the Black Hills, about two decades later they came back and said, this land's too good, we're gonna take it back and give you something else. But it wasn't just the negative consequence for the Native Americans, which I would suggest to you, 190 years later, has had consequence on those Native Americans in the fo following generations. But when America took those lands from the Native Americans, they put together what were called land lotteries. And if you were a white male, you could put your name in a hat and they would give you 10, 20 parcels of uh, acres of land that you could be able to start a family and build a business on. If you were black, if you were Asian, if you were a woman, or you were an Indian, you could not put your name in the hat for that land. So people were able to build generational wealth that the land that was given to them by our government so graciously that had been taken away from the Indians. Here's the point I'm making. A decision made by Andrew Jackson in 1830 still has consequences almost 200 years later. Consequences of good for some people and consequences of bad for others. In much the same way when Israel, the kings of Israel would make decisions about their land Manasseh, who was the grandfather of Josiah, Manasseh was the most wretched king in the history of Israel. For almost 55 years he reigned and did all kinds of evil. The Bible says the kinds of evil he came up with had never been seen or known before. He led Israel into unprecedented levels of ungodliness. And when Josiah came to try to bring about his reforms, what Josiah found is that he was working against, at this particular point in time, almost 70 years of negative history and tradition about worshiping foreign deities and watering down the word of God to the point that they were not even celebrating the Passover. Then when Zedekiah took over, we read in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse one through five, the Bible says this. This is what the Lord says. Go down to the palace to the king of Judah and proclaim this message there. Hear the word of the Lord, you king of Judah, those of you who sit on David's throne, you, your officials, and your people who come through these gates. This is what the Lord said, Jeremiah says. Do what is right and just. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Do not shed innocent blood in this place. By the way, these are themes you read throughout Jeremiah and many of the prophets. This idea of being fair to the people that are poor. This idea of not alienating the, the foreigner or the stranger or the alien. For if you are careful to carry out these commands, then kings who sit on David's throne will come through these gates riding on chariots and on horses accompanied by their officials and their people. In other words, God is gonna protect you if you will lead the people in doing what is right. But if you do not obey these commandments, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this place will become a ruin. Zedekiah, as the king of Israel, had a choice. Do I yield to the word of God as given to me through the prophet Jeremiah? Do I repent and do I change our ways or do we stay on the track that we are on? And the decision that Zedekiah made not just affected him. It affected the silversmith. The man who was running his own business who treated people fairly, who loved his wife and his kids and was trying to be loyal to the word of God, his life was turned upside down because of Zedekiah's decision. The young newlyweds that were married with great dreams about their life and their future. That young man may have lost his life in battle, may have been taken to slavery, but their dreams and their future was no, no longer possible because of Zedekiah's rebellion and because of his un unwillingness to follow the Lord. In other words, my friends, when Zedekiah made the decision not to yield to the Lord, and by the way, we read in chapter number 34 that Zedekiah did in fact get a little bit nervous and he and the officials actually began to implement the word of the Lord briefly. 
In chapter 34, verse 8 through 11, the Bible says that Jeremiah came to them and said, the Lord says, free free all of your Hebrew slaves. Free them all. And the Bible says that they freed them. And then it says in verse number 11, they changed their mind and took the slaves back. Jeremiah says, what you have done is rebellion against the Lord. And because Zedekiah did not have the courage to lead, did not have the courage to follow God, did not have the courage to make the difficult decisions and to do what was right, the city of Jerusalem was taken. It was leveled. The temple was destroyed. And people's lives, hundreds and thousands of people's lives were upended because of his decision. Leaders do not just make decisions for themselves. They make decisions that have far-reaching and long-lasting consequence. Second of all, God uses leaders, but not always the way that we think. We have the proclivity, and I use the word we because I do as well, that we have certain categories that are important to us. And then what we do is that we sort of determine good leaders and bad leaders based upon how they address the issues that are important to us. And we have a way of thinking that the people that we vote for or that we like are good leaders and these other people who stand for issues or agendas that we don't agree with, that they're bad people, that they're working against God. Our guy or gal is for God. The other guy or gal is against God. Yet when we read the history of Israel, we read more specifically in the book of Jeremiah that the people that you thought God was using were actually working against his will. And people that we assume God would be against, the Lord actually was using. Jeremiah 25, verse one through three, once again speaking about Zedekiah, Jeremiah answered, tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel, I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them, uh, gather them inside this city. Now notice this, verse number five. I will fight against you with outstretched hands and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. Israel was the people of God. Jerusalem was the city of God. And yet the Lord says, I am going to fight against you, Zedekiah, and I'm going to fight against your people if you do not do what I tell you to do. Later in chapter 21, verses 12 through 14, this is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning. Rescue the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil that you have done. Uh, Burn with no one to quench it. I am against you, Jerusalem. This is his city, his people. The Lord says, I am against you, you who live above the valley on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. You who said, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? The Lord says, I will punish your deeds, the deeds that you deserve. And I will kinder a fire in your forest and I will consume everything around you. Now these are strong, strong words. The Lord said to Jerusalem, his city. The Lord said to the Hebrews, his people. The Lord said to Zedekiah, his king, I will fight against you. But it gets worse. In chapter 25, verse number nine, we read this sobering verse. I will summon all the people of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land and inhabitants and against the surrounding nations. Now, I want you to look at this. If you have a Bible, it's worth highlighting. My being God, servant, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan. A pagan. He worshiped foreign gods, which goes against the Ten Commandments. 
He was a ruthless military leader. Now, we do read in the book of Daniel that there were on two different occasions where Nebuchadnezzar did show respect and fear from God when, uh, when Daniel, the, he had the, the, the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he did show some humility towards the Lord God, but ultimately, he was a pagan. He was not a worshiper of one God. He was not a worshiper of Yahweh. He did all kinds of immorality. As I said before, when he captured Zedekiah because of Zedekiah's rebellion, you know what Nebuchadnezzar did? He killed his son in front of Nebuchadnezzar and then he poked his eyes out. So the last thing Zedekiah saw was his son being killed in front of him. He was a ruthless man. And yet the Bible says that he is my servant. Listen, this this is unsettling. It should be unsettling because God is using someone that that we do not think God should use. And if you think that you would be different, I ask you to look at the book of Habakkuk because Habakkuk was a prophet who also lived during the time of Jeremiah. And Habakkuk said, Lord, how long, how long before you, you bring renewal to our people? And the Lord responded to Habakkuk in chapter number one and verse number six and seven, five, six, seven. I am going to raise up the Babylonians, these impetuous people to bring judgment upon my people. And you know what Habakkuk's response was? God, you cannot do that. Lord, you cannot use Nebuchadnezzar. You cannot use the Babylonians because they are ungodly. They are unrighteous. They're not your people. See, Habakkuk thought God should bring judgment, but Habakkuk had his own idea of what it should look like. And you know what? Here's the cold, hard truth. If you and I lived in 586 B.C., we would have been just like Zedekiah and just like all the people in Israel except Jeremiah and a handful of others. We would have believed that God was on our side. We would have believed that Zedekiah was God's man. We would have believed that the Lord was going to fight for us, not against us. And we would have believed that Nebuchadnezzar was an ungodly man that God never could have used. And we would have been just as wrong as they were. Much like the great song by Bob Dylan, God is on our side, we always have the ability to think that God is always with us. And whatever our cause is, God is with and for. But here's the lesson, my friends. We need to humble ourselves and realize that sometimes God in his sovereignty has a plan and a purpose. And sometimes people that we do not think that God can use, leaders, people that may upset us, people that may anger us, people that may stand for issues that we don't agree with, maybe God is using them to carry out a bigger purpose than we can see in the short term. And maybe people that we think stands for issues that are important to us and that God is using them, maybe long term, they're not necessarily fighting for God like we think. And I am not making judgment on anybody in in the current world of politics, because let me just tell you, I have no clue. But I'll tell you this. We need to hold our political leaders loosely and humbly. Because when we put too much confidence in the people that we elect, my friends, I'm telling you, we are in the same dangerous territory that Israel was. When we start thinking that this politician represents God and his agenda, we are walking in very dangerous ground. Third, it is easier for leaders to change laws than to change hearts. In 1920, America passed a law called prohibition. It may have been well-intended and well-meaning, but I think all of us know the story. It enabled all kinds of corruption. It empowered gangs and mobsters and everything else to take place and all kinds of illegal activity. And you know what it did? Because it did not change people's hearts. All it did was enable all kinds of mass crime to become more prevalent in our country. Because leaders can pass laws and they can change rules, but when hearts are not changed, very little ultimately is changed. I told you earlier that Josiah was a good king. He was the godly king. Uh, Jehoiachin, Jehoiakin, uh, Zedekiah, these these guys were just, they they were like many of them. They were very immature. They were very flip-floppy. They were very immoral like their grandfather and their great-grandfather. But Josiah, who took over at eight years old, who began to seek the Lord at 16, who restored the temple, 
Josiah's heart was fully set on God. Josiah called the people to celebrate the Passover. He called the people to renewal. He kicked out the temple prostitutes. He tore down the Asherah poles. He drove out the diviners. He did all of this stuff to try to bring renewal to the nation of Israel. But even though the people followed the king, their hearts were still not given over to God. All that Josiah did was good and well-intended. But unfortunately, the people did not change their hearts. They only conformed their behaviors temporarily. And as soon as Zedekiah and as soon as Jehoiakim and the other priests, uh, other kings began to implement and to allow idolatry to take place again, the people jumped right back on it again. Jeremiah chapter three, verse number six says, during the reign of Josiah, the Lord said to me, you have seen what faithless Israel has done. She has gone up to every high hill and every uh, spreading, uh, spreading tree and has committed adultery there. So even though the people were conforming their actions in Jerusalem where Josiah had brought about the reforms, they were still sneaking out at night and they were going to the high places and they were still worshiping the other gods they had been raised with. Because remember, Josiah brought his reforms after 55 years of Manasseh leading the people astray and two years of Ammon. Some of them had never even knew the word of the Lord. They'd only maybe heard a few stories and so they went back to what they knew. Jeremiah 12, 2 says, you are always on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. It seems as though my reading of the the Bible and history says that it seems like bad leaders always bring about much uh, greater and faster consequences than good leaders. Good leaders often make decisions that are very slow to settle in. Good leaders often make decisions that take times for the goodness of those decisions to be manifested. But bad leaders often get a big following very quickly. Josiah tried to bring about reform, but unfortunately the people did not truly transform their hearts because only God can change a heart. And without a changed heart, very little changes. So in closing, let me just share two things. What do we do with this? Next week we're going to talk about spiritual leaders and their culpability in the fall of Jerusalem. But as we think about our civil leaders, our political leaders, I'm not telling you by any means who to support or who not to support. I have no idea. I have opinions just like you. I have people that I like and people that I don't like and people that make me angry and people that make me more excited. But I would simply say two things, especially in the climate that we're living in. Number one, stay humble. Stay humble about your party, about your politics, and about your person that you support. Because let me tell you something. Just like they missed it in the days of Israel, we can miss it even today. I love the story of Billy Graham, who I have a great deal of respect for. And Billy Graham, uh, early in his ministry, would endorse certain political candidates. And uh, he was very close to Richard Nixon. And after Richard Nixon fell and resigned, Billy Graham came out and said, I'll never endorse another president again. Because he realized that in many ways, Richard Nixon, who was a friend of his, had been manipulating him and had not been truly honest with him. Billy Graham had to learn his lesson the hard way. He said, I will never endorse another president again. I will pray for them. I'll support all of them. I'm going to respect every every president, but I'm not going to get in the corner of one guy again. He learned his lesson the hard way. And I would encourage us as people of God to look at the lessons we see in the life of Jeremiah and keep our politics and to keep our people humble and to realize that we may see things and we have perspectives, but God has a much broader view. You see, God is working to build his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes that means that he may throw uh, a wrench into things. It means sometimes just like he had to allow the nation of Israel to suffer consequence and go into exile for 70 years, sometimes God may allow something negative to happen for a greater good to ultimately happen. Stay humble, I beg you. And then second of all, I would encourage us to heed the words of the apostle Peter. Peter lived at a time when the emperor of Rome was thriving. Israel was subservient to Rome. And many people actually worshiped the emperor as a god, as a deity. And there were some of the kings like Caligula and uh, Nero that were incredibly ungodly and anti-Christian kings. But here's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, 17. 
Show proper respect to everyone. And by the way, the larger context here, verses 13 through 17, all speak about our relationship to the government. He said, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Show respect. I think as believers, we have the opportunity to model what it means to show respect even to people who we disagree with. Love the family of God. This truly is our home, not there. Fear God. Because God is often working in ways that we do not know and we do not understand. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Whether that emperor we think represents us or whether that emperor we think does not. We don't have to agree or support everything they say and do, but we are to show proper honor and respect as Christians and as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Because ultimately, my friends, remember this. This world is not our home. And God uses leaders, civic political leaders, to carry out his purposes. Some of them are good, some of them are not. But every single one of them are human. They are fallible, just like you and me. And because of that, we need to stay humble and we need to honor the words of the Apostle Peter. And in doing so, I pray that God is glorified and that God is able to raise up the leaders that will lead us as a nation and as a world into the place that he wants to take us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you help us to stay humble as it pertains to politics, political structures, and people. We are very blessed to live in a country where we have a voice and we have a vote. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to take that responsibility and to use it wisely. But once again, dear God, help us never to be so presumptuous to presume to know who your man or your woman is. And Lord, I pray that you help us to stay humble and I pray that you help us to, to, to live the words of the Apostle Peter, which was specifically written in the context of government and what we would today call politics that we would in fact honor the emperor, not just the emperor that we support, but the emperor that we oppose. That we would love the family of God, that we would fear God, and that we would show respect to all people. And as we do this, Lord, I pray that the church would be respected and that your word would go forth in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everyone, this is the first Sunday of the month, and as we do every week here at Palm West, we celebrate communion on the first Sunday. Um, and so uh, if you're watching this, we encourage you to get the elements. If you have juice or bread, uh, take those. You can pause this and actually grab it as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Uh, we do have some elements, some individual cups ordered. So when we begin to meet together as a church family, we're going to have some individual cups where we can, uh, God willing, be able to celebrate communion here at the church. But those have been back ordered. Peter ordered them, I think, back in April or, or uh, March. And uh, we still are waiting for those to come in. But today, uh, as we take communion, I just want to share with you one verse from uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, communion is multifaceted. There are multiple things about it. There is the act of remembrance, what Jesus did. There is the act of repentance for our sin. There's the sense of unity that we have when we take communion. We're celebrating unity with believers all over the world. But another element of communion is that it's very forward thinking. That as we take this act today and we take these elements right now in the here and now, it's reminding us that we are participating in the Lord's death until what? He comes back again. When the kingdom of God will be fully manifested. When there will be no more injustice. When there will be no more debates about what is right and what is wrong. There will be no more le need for earthly leaders or even spiritual leaders because God will truly be our leader and because we will be able to live our life with the fullness of God, without the presence of sin. And all of the structures that we have in this world, earthly human structures, church structures, these things will be unnecessary because we're gonna be in the presence of God. He will be our God and we will be his people living in this environment that we can only dream about. And so today, in light of today's message, as we talked about earthly leaders and the structures that we're facing right now and the challenges that we're facing, 
Today is an opportunity for us to acknowledge as we take these elements, to remind ourselves that the body of Christ was broken and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and that we're part of the problem because we're sinners. And just as we sin, our leaders also fall short. But we take these elements proclaiming our belief in the death and the resurrection of Jesus until what? Until he comes back again to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so I ask you to take the bread at this time and join me as we pray and we take the bread. Father, we thank you for your body that was broken for us, that we may be unified, that we may be forgiven, and that we may be reminded that just as your body was broken and just as you rose again from the grave, you will come back again to establish your kingdom on this earth a kingdom that makes all the things that we debate and get frustrated about so unnecessary. So Lord Jesus, we take this with gratitude, remembering your body that was broken and the kingdom that you will come to establish. You may take the bread. Lord, we now take this cup a reminder of the blood of Christ that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We are a fallen people, a sinful people, and all of the leaders that we look up to are equally fallen. But you, Lord Jesus, have offered forgiveness and transformation through your blood. You've offered to change us in this life, and you've offered us the hope of life eternal. And so, Lord, we now thank you for the gift of forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to stay humble, recognizing our fallen nature. And now as we confess our sin, we take this cup with anticipation of the life that is yet to be. You may drink the cup. Thank you for joining us in communion today. May God bless you. As is our practice on the Sundays of communion, we end our service by singing together the Lord's Prayer. Let's sing. We're so glad you joined us today, and it's our hope and prayer that this video worship service helps you feel connected with the Palm West Community Church family and is a blessing to you. Now let us remember together the job that Jesus has for us. 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. God bless you. Thank you.